Greetings, comrades, and welcome to the Eastern Border. We are back with some news and interesting updates and quite a few things that, um, that yeah, have made me thought about about the possible political implications. First things first, though, is that um, due to how our Latvian tax system works, we uh, have now been forced to start the process of turning our show into an LLC, or a GmbH to German audiences. A limited liability company, nothing is going to change for you, it's probably going to change quite a bit for me. Been running around these few days since, well, the tax man cometh. And, well, we have to figure out what taxes to pay and where and what to do with them. Well, all this, all this situation. Secondly, we had an interview with a kind of a Latvian celebrity, Dana Sarova, who's half Latvian, half Ukrainian, and she's been very well known in Latvia and in, in Eastern Europe for her activities and her uh, social presence and everything. And she had quite a lot of awesome things to say. That's being that's being edited right now. It's going to be a pretty long one, about an hour long. And I hope that you all will all enjoy this. But for now, for now, for this this point, let's uh, let's look at some some news. First off, I'd like to start with um, with Igor Girkin's report, as usual. And this time, I want to kind of advertise to you a site called WarTranslated.com, all in one word. Like our friend Dmitri, who provides these translations for us, yeah, he he's now he now has a website, and well, that just seems amazing. So, hey, go check that out. There's a lot of intercepted calls as well if you're interested in that kind of stuff. But we're sticking to Girkin, and after that, we're gonna talk about United States weapons deliveries and some interesting things that have been found in a captured. Captured a uh, captured command truck. Well, Ukrainians captured a, a command truck, and oh boy. So, what happened in the front line? Kharkiv. The front line has stabilized at a slight distance from and along the Russian Federation border. The fights are positional. South of Izium, no changes. Krasny Liman. The operation has mostly concluded. Remnants of the defeated enemy units. Again, this is Igor Girkin talking, when I mention enemy here, he speaks about Ukraine. Are leaving the eastern bank of Severny Donetsk. Russian forces are clearing the adjacent forests. Could also note that it was not possible to cross the river on the enemy's shoulders, and that's in quotes, that's a metaphor here, and most likely the front line will be stabilized along this line the same way as upstream and downstream. Severodonetsk. The enemy, Snarling, is gradually leaving the city due to limited ability to support the garrison via destroyed bridges, which are under continu continuous artillery and aviation strikes of the Russian Federation Armed Forces. I presume the clearing of the industrial zone of the city will last another day or two, unlikely more, unless Ukraine throws in another large unit to be slaughtered. Lyshansk Zolotoy area. Fierce fights with a very slow advance on Russian Federation Armed Forces and Donetsk People's Republic Public Armed Forces, in addition to private military companies. Ukrainians uh, continue fierce resistance in the bag, hoping for it to be unblocked. Most likely, by deploying reserves, the Ukrainian Armed Forces managed to clear the bakhmut lishansk Highway, pushing out Russian forces. However, the highway is under continuous shelling, and supplying the Ukrainian group through it is difficult. It can be stated with a high degree of certainty that the outcome and timing of, of the conclusion of, mm, as he calls it, liberation of Lyshansk depends specifically on whether the Russian forces will be able to cut off these supply lines. In any case, this is extremely important since the advancing forces themselves are in a pocket with not that wide of a neck. So, until Zolotoy is taken, the danger for rears and flanks will remain. On the Bakhmut solidar line. No significant changes, local hostilities continue, the new front line is forming. In the Vdyevka area, no significant changes. Fights to improve the positions of Russian forces, fierce artillery skirmishes. Marinka area and to the south towards Uladar, no significant changes, positional fights. Same goes with, together with Zaporozhye front line. Now, interesting things about Kherson. Here, Girkin writes, quote, I believe that the attacks of Ukrainian armed forces in Davidov Brod area were quite large scale, but still only reconnaissance in force. Ukraine suffered substantial losses, however the amount of manpower and equipment brought into the battle does not allow us to speak about the disruption of the offensive. During the attacks, 
Ukrainians have had clear advantage, but did not achieve breakthrough of the front line. And, uh, of course, Donetsk, Makeyevka, Khodlivka, yesterday apparently were again under heavy artillery shelling by Ukrainian forces. Gherkin states, I do not rule out that the coming days the shelling can become truly massive. And here he makes some general conclusions. And, again, if you don't know what Igor Girkin is, go listen to some of our previous episodes or go check out wartranslated.com. That's a really interesting read. The advance of the Russian troops in Donbass is fading, and without deployment of fresh reserves will not lead to the, the, to the defeat of the enemy. Again, he speaks about Ukrainians here. At the moment, the most important question for the Russian command is the capture of Lyshansk, which will consolidate the successes in Popasna by liquidating the dangerous bulge of the Ukrainian armed forces' strong point in Lyshansk's Zolotoya area. Most likely, in the coming week, <coughs> the main efforts of our forces will be directed at completing this task, and Girkin is not expecting any major operation until this is done. The Russian armed forces and Donetsk Lugansk armed forces are in dire need of combined arms reserves to develop the achieved successes. In this regard, the hostilities are taking place in, for in, in the fortified advance and saturated enemy forces positions are characterized as gnawing through the defenses, inevitably leading to heavy losses for both sides without major successes for the attacker. As of 1st of June, the Ukrainian armed forces group in Donbass is not defeated, although it took significant losses and was forced to abandon a number of important localities. In a month, Popasnya, Severlodatsk, Krasny Liman, Severodonetsk, and in places retreat, retreat to the second line of defense. And here Girkin makes predictions uh, for the next 7 to 10 days. Russian forces will be forced to continue attacking Lyshansk, trying to defeat or at least push out the defending group of Ukrainians and capture the city. New attempts to cross Seversky Donetsk are possible. And he writes, I hope that if they happen, they will not be failures like all before them. Ukrainians will, of course, continue defending it in this area. At other parts of the Donetsk front line, the offensive battles will presumably be of a tactical nature, except for perhaps Adyevka, where a promising offensive to the north was stopped in favor for transferring forces to Severodonetsk Lyshan's direction. And he predicts some Ukrainian actions as well. The enemy is likely to continue finding weak points in Russian defenses in Kherson and possibly Zaporozhye directions. At the same time, while having sufficient ground forces for a limited offensive, Ukrainians do not have substantial air support and medium-range air defenses capable of covering the battlefield from strikes by Russian aviation further than the first line of our defense. Therefore, with the timely discovery by a reconnaissance of the accumulation of strike forces of the enemy, it will undoubtedly be possible to stop their efforts. At the same time, the danger of a frontline breakthrough in case of an unexpected strike should not be ruled out. The Ukrainians are learning to fight quickly, and uh, this is my favorite part, because Igor Girkin obviously states this constantly. <clears throat> the foreign advisors are managing them quite well. <laughs> Again, this, this also kind of shows this chauvinistic attitude, since Girkin cannot accept that he's actually just fighting, fighting Ukrainians. It, it must be some uh, evil, evil foreigners helping out. However, there are some explanations about, again, why, um, why these losses have been kind of really bad for Russian army. See, I recently started watching this YouTube channel called Perun, and I'm actively trying to communicate with, with the person. If you listen to him as well and watch his videos, please let him know that the Eastern Border would like to have him for, on, on a show for an interview, because he made a great episode, like 40 minutes long, explaining how Russian military corruption actually works. And there he wrote about how everyone is just, you know, trying not to get punished and how everyone's trying to steal everything. And we got an example of this. Uh, basically, what happened this morning was that it was reported that Ukrainians had captured a command vehicle, a command armored vehicle of, of kind of an army group of Russians. And first thing that they found out is that the doors were just not locked, just like a car. They also had one of those huge locks put on them, on the doors, that you would probably, you know, lock your shed with or something. You know, these old, huge locks. And it was it was there that they understood that it's because, well, so that the common soldiers would not loot the insides of, of the, this armored armored vehicle. And, uh, well, it's a, it's a VMP, basically. And when the Ukrainians finally broke into that thing, they, of course, saw a lot of looted stuff, like uh, photo cameras and and microwaves, and all sorts of things, but what really surprised them was the sheer amount of walkie-talkies they found there. 
And if you look at the, look at the video about this, which Ukrainians have posted, one of them is confused because they obviously see some trophy walkie-talkies, like Motorola ones. And, you know, that's normal, they're, they're trophies. But the, the ridiculous amount of Russian, Russian kind of communications devices, these walkie-talkie things, it was crazy there. And then when they looked at the documents, turns out that the commanding officer of this tactical group had decided that, you know, as the common Russian soldier steals everything, sells out, sells off everything, and is bound to lose things, yeah, and he has to kind of account for these walkie-talkies. Well, he didn't want to get into trouble with his higher-ups, so you can imagine how a, a whole battalion of troops all had to give up their walkie-talkies and communication devices to the officer so that they wouldn't lose them or sell them away so that this guy wouldn't, wouldn't be in trouble. And that this also kind of shows how corruption can hurt way way more than the, just the price of the walkie-talkies, because you wouldn't expect that on a modern battlefield, the commanders would send a whole tactical group without their communications. But apparently this actually has happened, and like the Russian commentator that I found this uh, found this news on stated, well, yeah, you know, if um, if he had actually given those those uh, walkie-talkies to the soldiers, maybe right now he wouldn't have lost this this uh, BMP this armor vehicle, which is just kind of kind of crazy if you think about it. It's quite funny. And also what I wanted to talk about is the whole shenanigans with, um, with, with the rocket devices that will be sent to, sent to Ukraine by the United States. See, I was, I was quite stunned when Mr. Biden, President Biden, stated that the United States would not deliver weapons that, with, with capabilities that could strike inside Russia. And my first question was, well, wait a minute, there are fights like right next to the Russian border, you can just fight a javelin inside there. And that, that was kind of weird, because, well, why? Is this some sort of confusion? Did he mean Moscow? What's going on there? And today, well, today we heard reports that Ukrainians have promised to not to fire these uh, 50 to 70 kilometer range missiles in, in Russian territory. They have given promises to the Americans about this situa situation as to not, not escalate it too much. So what it looks like is massive amounts of plausible deniability. You know, now if, uh, if some sort of, I don't know, base blows up somewhere in Belograd, then um, then the Americans are like, nope, we, 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 we never wanted to give them rockets that can strike Russian territory, and, and, and they promised not to strike it, so I don't know, it's Comrade Sergei who dropped, uh, dropped his cigarette butt or something. But what's really important here is, what is Russia? And this is this is bizarre, and this is more interesting than you might think, because the the question that has eluded so many commentators, and also in the West, which I implore you to think about and maybe write in the comment section here, is that how does this relate to Donetsk, Lugansk, and especially Crimea? Would would missile strikes in Crimea be accepted? I mean. And, and there are there are some rumors going on that this probably includes Crimea as the Russia part, but does not include Luhansk and Donetsk, since Russia would treat an attack on Crimea as an attack on Russian mainland, although it, no one really admits it's it's Russia. But uh, that that situation could be a political thing, and it also kind of plays into into the whole feeling that. A lot of politicians have been saying that Ukrainians will probably have to give up some land and territory in this conflict. On the one side, you know, I've been against such kind of a weird sort of giving up in this war. But this also could be interesting in the sense that if Ukrainian soldiers accept that some of the territory will be lost no matter what, say this Donetsk and Lugansk region, and that they'll have to, you know, give up on Crimea then, and, and they're allowed to shoot at these districts, and we now see the shelling of Donbass. It's quite active. They, they shoot, uh, like, because the civilians have been evacuated, and there's a lot of army, and those people, republics are there, and they're shelling them with artillery. And, and if you think about it, well, it just makes sense to bombard the prize that the West is constantly pushing you to give to the Russians and to make it less valuable. I mean... If I was Ukrainians and I would be, you know, I would have to make some pragmatic decisions about how to end this war and how long can we fight and what can we gain from this war. 
And if I would be, and I doubt they are doing this because I, I think they really, you know, want to get back all of their country, which just makes sense because if you would tell them to to leave parts of their country to the occupier, well, yeah, tell that to, to other nations. I don't think, I really don't think anyone would want to do that. But if they would be forced to do so, if the West would force them to sit down and accept some loss of the treaty, which they wouldn't do on their own, I think they would try to do as much damage to the territory that they are about to lose as humanly possible. You know, salt the earth, so to speak. Which also would cause kind of unnecessary destruction, of course, but unnecessary, well, on, on, on the Russian side, this is. I mean, if the West is forcing you to give away some parts of Donetsk and Lugansk, and you are at war right now, you might as well, if you know that you're going to be forced to give them away, turn them into a hellhole. Because, well, they've evacuated stuff, and... and yeah. But all in all, all these are just, you know, a bit of speculation, but just two things about what counts as Russia, and whether or not that's a really good idea to, to push Ukrainians for some return of territory, because, again, it would just be reasonable if they would then try to destroy all, as much of it as possible. So, in a way... Western people who are now forcing Ukraine to surrender, you guys might be pushing for um, for, ex for for extreme external damage being done to people. So that's all interesting. At any rate, thank you for listening and please support us on Patreon. We're gonna work hard to produce more episodes, and of course, we, we've gone nowhere. Just uh, trying to bring this whole thing into a in a corporation. And yeah. Thank you once again. До свидания, товарищи. And remember, happiness is mandatory.